Hello, everyone, and welcome to On the Safe Side, a monthly podcast hosted by the editors of Safety and Health Magazine, the official magazine of the National Safety Council. This is Safety and Health Associate Editor Kevin Drewley, and with me, as always, are colleagues and fellow Associate Editors Alan Ferguson and Barry Botino. This is our May 2022 episode, the 27th in podcast history. Wherever or however you're listening today, we thank you for spending some time with us. It's greatly appreciated. We know that many of you have had a unique journey into the safety profession, and we want to hear more about it for our My Story feature in our magazine. We invite you and your colleagues to submit your personal stories about how you got into the safety field by emailing us at safehealth at nsc.org. You also can view past My Story entries and catch up on other news from around the safety world on our website at safetyandhealthmagazine.com. This month's episode is sponsored by KPA. We extend our thanks to the organization and look forward to telling you more about KPA shortly. In this month's episode, Barry will take us on a deep dive into his feature story covering lightning safety. We also will be joined by Dr. Gigi Petrie, a social scientist and co-director of the NIOSH Center for Productive Aging and Work. Dr. Petrie will discuss the growing number of older workers and how employers can best accommodate them while building an age-friendly workplace. Additionally, we'll be trotting out a new segment at the end of the podcast, so please stay tuned to learn more. Is everybody ready? Let's get this episode rolling. Each month here at On the Safe Side, we take a look at a feature story from the latest issue of Safety and Health Magazine, which we call our Deep Dive segment. In the May issue, Barry looks at how to keep workers safe from lightning, a pertinent topic with summer thunderstorms and severe weather on the horizon. While incidents are rare, what makes lightning particularly dangerous, especially to certain professions, is that it can strike with little to no warning. Barry, thank you so much for your work on this feature story. Now, will you take us around the pool and down to the deep end? Well, certainly. Thanks for that introduction, Alan. I appreciate it. Uh, In in researching this story, we shared with our readers that the odds of being killed by a lightning strike are pretty low. Uh, In fact, the National Safety Council's Injury Facts Database says those odds are 1 in 138,849. And to put that in perspective, a, a worker dying from radiation or extreme temperatures is 10 times more likely uh, to die from those than to die from a lightning strike death. The National Lightning Safety Council reported only 11 lightning-related fatalities in 2021, which is the lowest number ever recorded by that organization. Now, three of those deaths involve workers, uh, a 60-year-old working in construction in Wisconsin, a 19-year-old roofer in Florida, and also a 19-year-old lifeguard in New Jersey. So as you can see by the geographical location of those three fatalities, the dangers of lightning are real anywhere that has workers in outdoor settings, and they can't be ignored. Uh, This is especially true in the spring and summer months when lightning and thunderstorms are much more prevalent. And on its website, OSHA has a fact sheet uh, that says employers should recognize lightning as an occupational hazard, and both supervisors and workers should take lightning safety seriously. So, Just to give you some context here, the electrical system in your average household has 120 volts and about 15 amps. Uh, A lightning strike, according to the National Weather Service, is approximately 300 million volts and 30,000 amps. So you can just imagine the damage that could do to the human body. I spoke with Kevin Beauregard, who is the director of the Occupational Health and Safety Division of North Carolina's Department of Labor, And he said ignoring a hazard like lightning is frankly unwise, uh, regardless of what may be very rare occurrences of worker fatalities. And he said the last time you want to do something about lightning is when it's actually happening. In other words, it should be on the minds of workers and safety professionals wherever you have folks working outdoors. In fact, lightning can still be a concern even in advance of a storm because it does often appear well before a single drop of rain falls. Uh, Many sources use the advice that when thunder roars, your awareness for lightning and finding shelter should immediately rise as well. So what are the most important takeaways for workers when it comes to safety in a storm? Well, Kevin, I think the the, the sources I spoke to brought up two big things, as with many other hazards that are planning and training. Uh, So as far as planning goes, supervisors and workers should absolutely rely on weather apps on their smartphones. Uh, NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has a very good app, uh, along with many others. Um, What weather apps can do is tell us about what conditions currently look like and also what they can possibly become. 
Um, weather apps are also a good source for alerts and warnings of oncoming severe weather. And that can happen, you know, sometimes at a moment's notice uh, when, it, when a summer storm rolls through. Uh, e- even though OSHA doesn't have a specific lightning safety standard, there is an applicable one. And that's 1926.35, uh, which covers emergency action plans. And where this comes into play is that it covers escape procedures and routes evacuation, and training of workers. And Kevin Beauregard said uh, from North Carolina that an employer can't control if there's going to be a lightning strike or not, but what they can control is making sure employees are properly trained and they know what they should do in the event of an approaching storm or if they find themselves in a storm. Uh, Knowing where the nearest shelter is can be really important. Of course, finding indoor shelter is preferred. Uh, A fully enclosed building is best, especially the one that has electrical and plumbing, because those things can conduct the power of a lightning strike much better than the human body can. If a building is not available, you can take shelter in a vehicle. Uh, The recommended vehicle is one that is hard topped and metal. And of course, please keep those windows rolled up, folks. Um, Now, what if a building or a vehicle aren't available? Um, The next course of action would be to identify a low-lying spot, uh, such as a ditch, a culvert, a valley, or a dense area of small trees. Lightning is attracted to the tallest object in an area, and there's also concern about being in or near bodies of water because a lightning strike can actually spread out over a body of water. You should also avoid being near large isolated trees, large equipment, or working at heights during a storm. So are there specific industries or jobs where lightning can be more of a hazard than others? Well, Alan, OSHA lists quite a few of those on its uh, fact sheet, as I mentioned, um, which we'll link to uh, in our show notes for this episode so folks can use that fact sheet. Um, Those include roofing, logging, heavy equipment operation, plumbing and pipe fitting, landscaping, uh, airport ground personnel, and pool and beach lifeguarding. Uh, Construction is also a big one. And I spoke to Kevin Cannon, uh, who's the Senior Director of Safety and Health Services for the Associated General Contractors of America for this story. And he said a unique aspect of construction as it relates to lightning is that you have to look at safety in these cases from the perspective of where a job is being done. He said this can differ from civil contractors and their projects, roads, bridges, tunnels, and sewer systems to building contractors who are constructing residential or commercial projects. Uh, Now, when you talk about buildings, um, even those have plenty of differences. And Kevin Cannon mentioned that you could be working in a fully enclosed building, you could be working working in a partially enclosed building, or even working in one that is simply just framed. We mentioned working at heights before, and Kevin Beauregard said, the importance for workers in what he called working in a raised position is the ability to get down before lightning strikes. And that's gonna take some planning and knowing how long the process of descending from your area of work will take if bad weather approaches. You mentioned workers, for example, who work on water towers, utility poles, scaffolding, uh, tower cranes, uh, communications tower, or even on a wind turbine. Um, That's where he said checking the weather before you start a job is really essential. And this didn't make the story, but but Kevin Beauregard talked about two important industries in North Carolina, which are agriculture and the golf course industry. And he mentioned those because workers often can be in the middle of a field or a fairway without the ability to get to shelter. Now, OSHA says to try to avoid being the tallest thing in a given area and also to avoid lying flat on the ground. You should also avoid being around wiring, plumbing, and fencing because those things can conduct electricity. Now, an open shed or a pavilion or a covered porch may get you out of the rain, uh, but it just doesn't provide enough adequate protection from lightning. Thank you once again, Barry, for your work on this story. If you want to read more about lightning safety or other topics and news from around the safety world, please check out the May issue of Safety and Health Magazine or visit safetyandhealthmagazine.com. We'd like to thank the sponsor of this month's episode, KPA. KPA provides environmental health and safety software, consultation, and award-winning online training to help organizations stay compliant with state and federal regulations, as well as maintain a safe and productive workplace. 
The KPA EHS software platform is easy to use, highly configurable, and designed for a mobile workforce which encourages broad adoption and an improved culture of safety across the organization. You can learn all about KPA by visiting them online at kpa.io. Make no mistake, the workforce is aging. Bureau of Labor Statistics data show that in 2020, 24% of workers were age 55 or older, up from 19% a decade before. Identifying and reducing the risks that many older workers face, especially those who perform hands-on labor, can keep them injury-free. That's an important consideration not only in May, which is Older Americans Month, but throughout the entire year. With us to share more insight into this topic is Dr. Gigi Petrie, a social scientist and co-director of the NIOSH Center for Productive Aging and Work. Dr. Petrie specializes in successful aging at work and other issues related to the aging workforce and has presented her research internationally. Gigi, we thank you for joining us on The Safe Side for this latest installment of Five Questions With. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. As we detail in a feature story in this month's issue of Safety and Health, the number of older workers is growing. Uh, In which industries are they most prevalent and what are the common challenges facing older workers? So as you mentioned, yes, the the proportion of uh, workers age 55 and older is growing and it's projected to continue to grow for the coming decades. So uh, for instance, by 2030, it's expected to grow to 25.1%, whereas the younger age groups are actually going to be staying stable or declining. Now, we're seeing this aging happening in many industries, most industries, as a matter of fact. So um, industries that have a higher proportion of older workers than that overall average of about 24% include agriculture, utilities, manufacturing, transportation, finance and insurance, education, medical, community and social services, services, and public administration. So that's a lot. Um, And an interesting, we also see higher rates of self-employment for older workers, particularly for people that are age 65 and older. Now, some common challenges that older workers face. Well, there's things that you probably are already thinking of. Um, There's inadequate retirement savings. So people need to keep working for financial reasons. And there's also the high cost of health insurance that, that goes on. So there may be people that would like to retire, or they may even have health issues that really make it so they should be retiring, but they can't afford to retire because they need that health insurance. So they're waiting for Medicare to kick in. Um, There are physical health issues. So this is something that's talked about quite frequently is the association between age and declines in physical health. I I just want to put a caveat on that, that uh, when people, when the onset of these physical health conditions happens, it really varies from person to person. So it's not, these don't happen at any particular set time in someone's life. They can happen earlier or later in someone's life. And just because you have physical health issues doesn't mean that they necessarily interfere with your functioning ability. Um, and they, so the extent to which health factors interfere with your functioning, it also varies Uh, from person to person. So people can go for a long period of time without experiencing declines in functioning and other people, they'll experience those declines earlier on. So there's a lot of variability there. Um, Just something to mention uh, that's kind of related to this, thinking about occupational injuries and fatalities on the job. I just want to just point out a couple of of statistics here um, because people think about this quite a bit. So first I'll talk about the the more extreme of these, and that's the fatalities among workers that are age 55 and older. They do tend to be higher compared to the younger age groups, but overall these fatalities, occupational fatalities are actually decreasing. So that's really happy news. Um, Now, when we look at injury rates, It's actually where older workers, they tend to be safer workers and they don't experience the same amount of injuries on the job that younger workers do. They're actually, the rates are much lower than than all of the younger age groups. So uh, with that caveat set aside, 
probably the biggest challenge I say that older workers face, and actually this is an issue that younger workers face, um, people just entering the workforce also face, but it's pervasive negative age bias. Um, so I'll just focus on, on the older worker aspect of this, but just bear in mind that this is something that younger workers also face. So um, age stereotypes and this negative bias, it really persists in our society and has it is, it's existed really for centuries and probably millennia. Um, there just is a, a strong negative bias about older workers. And it comes down to this idea that as people age, their value declines. Um, now, even though this persists, there isn't really a, 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 a empirical basis for the idea that employee productivity declines with age. Actually, there's been numerous studies that have been done that have shown that there really is no relationship between productivity and age. So what that means is that as people age, they can remain just as productive as younger workers. So that's a, a real strong myth that exists out there. But the problem, another problem with these negative bias, this negative stereotype is that people are also aware of these. We grew up with these and they can buy into this, these ideas about what these stereotypes are presenting and they can actually begin to self-stereotype. So that's where they start to really believe that these stereotypes about people in their age group are true about them. And then they begin to embody those stereotypes and they become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So uh, a couple of real strong stereotypes that exist out there are um, older workers are stubborn and stuck in their ways. So people think if you're, if you buy into the stereotype, then you will be less willing to uh, give new ideas, new things a try. The other one that is really pervasive is about older workers' ability to learn new things. Um, and so if you believe that you are not going to be able to learn things because of your age, then you're not going to try to learn new things be, uh, because you say you're too old. Uh, now, it's it's not that older workers can't learn. They actually can learn. It may take a little bit more time than a younger worker, but they're absolutely able to learn to do new things. Uh, and I just also want to mention that there are some real strong ramifications about this uh, that are associated with this uh, pervasive negative bias that exists towards older workers. So for individuals, um, having these negative beliefs about um, about aging and, and being stereotyped, it actually has an impact on people's health. And so people that, it, that have these beliefs or experiences, it, it really, they, they have worse health outcomes as they age. It also uh, limits their employment opportunities, as you can imagine. But there's also um, a, a price to be paid at the organizational level. So the, if, you have an organization where age bias is is really existing and and thriving then you have a less engaged workforce overall and you it really is affecting your work culture you'll have a really poor work culture and you'll have a loss of skilled workers people don't want to stay around in a in a in a workplace where there's a bad work culture so people will leave and not just the older workers but you'll also get younger workers leaving uh, and then at the societal level, the, the cost that we have to pay, the, the, the price that's paid is, um, so I'll, I'm going to give you a couple of, of statistics that were, uh, that have been published recently. So one of them is the cost of workplace age discrimination on the U.S. economy. And it's been estimated that in 2018, uh, the voluntary retirement, underemployment, and unemployment of older workers that result from workplace age discrimination has cost the U.S. Uh, economy approximately $850 billion. And that's just for a single year. And there, that's expected to continue to grow if we don't do something about this. And then I mentioned the health outcomes associated with this. So the there's a, um, a study that was done recently that 
um, estimated what the healthcare costs were that were associated with age discrimination and also negative age stereotyping and negative self perceptions of aging. And that was $63 billion in a single year just in the U.S. Employers often mention the, the value that older workers bring to the job. What are some of the benefits of these workers in building an age-friendly workplace? Well, I mean, I think there's many benefits of employing older workers. So just thinking about the workers themselves, they tend to be more committed to their organization that they work for. They, they, they um, talk good about their employer. They promote their employment. They do good things on the job. Uh, they tend to be more satisfied in their work, and they also tend to be very productive and dependable. They have low rates of absenteeism. They have low turnover intention, which means they have no intention of leaving the job. They also tend to be more emotionally stable so they don't fly off the handle or they can handle the stress more. Um, and they also have a great deal of experience and institutional knowledge that they possess, which is really, you can't put a price on that. The benefits, though, um, of having an age-inclusive or an age-friendly workplace on, on a broader scale are increased firm performance and a greater return on assets for those organizations. So it really can contribute to that bottom line. You get increased knowledge sharing. So that's two way it's it's not just the older workers that are sharing the knowledge but it's also younger workers you get people collaborating and working together more there is an increased employee productivity overall and lower employee turnover overall so people they want to stay in these work environments where they everyone is feeling very welcome and accepted uh, based on their age it's age inclusive and another thing is there's lower absenteeism overall. So those are some great benefits. So if a supervisor in, let's say, construction or manufacturing must discuss with an older worker their reality of a changing role as their physical skills diminish, how should he or she approach that responsibility? Well, that's a, that's a really uh, good question to ask. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of research that has been done on this. So what I'm going to be saying is, it's really speaking my personal opinions and my personal um, suggestions on how to go about doing this. So I want to preface this by saying that a worker is probably very much aware uh, of the personal toll that their physically demanding work has had on them. And they may be very concerned, maybe nervous, um, insecure about this and worry about um, worry about their employability and, and their role in an organization. So the best thing to do would, would be to show some personal care and concern for the worker and their health and well-being. That would be like the, the, the ground rules to start with. You want to make it, you know, like you care about this person. You want to tell the person that they're valuable, that they're valuable to the company, that you value the, the the work and the skills that they bring to the to the organization, you value the work that they've done, and that they will continue to add value to the company going forward. And then it's having a discussion about what are some options for them that will result in a mutually beneficial solution, something that's going to work for both, both the organization and for the employee. So it may be that there are some ergonomic modifications that could uh, be um, enacted that could really help the person continue to do their job in a safe manner, a safe and productive manner. So that could be maybe getting some tools that are not as heavy or um, have a better hand grip, for instance, or uh, installing some flooring underneath if in the case of a manufacturing so that they're uh it's not as hard on their feet and they're they're it's able to absorb some of the shocks and it's kinder on their joints maybe providing um a place to sit uh another thing you could do is thinking about 
job design or redesign modifications that could be done to the job. So uh, one thing that could be very successful would be doing something like job rotation. So um, that is where you'd have somebody working um, at a and maybe a more strenuous, physically demanding task for a shorter period of time. Maybe it's an hour, maybe it's two hours, and then they rotate off and they do something else and someone else goes in and does that more physically demanding job, that physically demanding task. Um, so nobody is, is being subjected to that real physical demanding work for any extended period of time. Another thing might be to uh, get people working in teams or in pairs so that it's lessening that, that strain. Um, it, it, another thing that, that workers can do, and particularly with the support of their uh, supervisors would be doing something called job crafting. And what this means is that the worker themselves can go about slightly modifying the way that they go about performing a task with the end goal in mind, but maybe doing these slight modifications that would uh, enable them to do a job in a manner that isn't so strenuous. And obviously you want to make sure that whatever those those modifications are that they're doing are still allowing them to perform the job in a safe manner. But those are some ideas. Um, at the more extreme end, it would be thinking about maybe a new role for, for an employee. And there's a number of different things that, um, that workers can do. So they could, they could be involved in doing training. Uh, someone who has been, you know, is highly skilled, highly knowledgeable about a job, they can help train the the, the next generation of workers coming in uh, to, to perform these jobs and teach them really um, how to go about doing this in a safe manner and, you know, really do a job well. Uh, some people may be able to become occupational and safety officers within an organization. So take on that role and really um, go about and ensuring people are working in a safe and health manner in, in the workplace. And then there's some people that might be suitable to take on a supervisory role. Now, I want to stress that just because someone is good in job X does not mean that they're going to be a good supervisor for people doing job X. But there are some people that, that may be a good transition for them and they may do well in that role. The big thing to think about is that as people age, a big motivator for them is something called generativity. And what that is, is there is a strong desire to want to give back. You want to leave a legacy. You want to uh, share your knowledge, share your skills, and you, you want to instill that upon someone else. So look for ways to really take advantage of that generativity motive that people have as they age. What more can you tell us about the work of the Center for Productive Aging and Work, and how do it and NIOSH view this concept of productive aging? Well, uh, so we call it NCPAW, National Center for Productive Aging and Work, um, and this was established in 2015, and we're a virtual center that's located within the Office of Total Worker Health here at NIOSH. And the way that we think about productive aging, we follow a definition from a gerontologist, Dr. Robert Butler. He, he was the founding director for the National Institute on Aging. And this is how he described it. Productive aging is an approach that emphasizes the positive aspects of growing older and how individuals can continue to make important contributions to their lives, their community and organizations, and society as a whole as they age. So NCPAW's approach towards productive aging, we have an overarching goal that's centered on workers' abilities to keep working safely and, pro and productively as they age. So we have four principal elements that we follow when thinking about this. So it, one is a, a lifespan perspective that views aging as a continuous and dynamic process that occurs across the entire working life and beyond working life. Then there's also a co comprehensive and holistic approach to occupational safety and health that integrates both personal and work factors of life. 
There's an emphasis on mutually beneficial outcomes that address the needs of workers and employers alike. And finally, there's a concern for multi-generational issues that leverage the strengths of an age-inclusive work organization and culture. Now, there are three broad topic categories that we focus on in our work at NCPA. So the first one is best practices and sustainable interventions organizations can adopt. The second one are organizational health disparities. So these are a function of both individual and occupational characteristics. And then the third one is the changing nature of work. And as we've talked about, aging workforce is an integral part of the changing nature of work. We have two broad types of activities that we engage in here at the center. The first one is research. And so I'll give you a couple of examples of some projects that we currently have going on. One of them is with the manufacturing sector, and we're working on developing an e-tool to, to aid the manufacturing sector in creating an age-friendly work environment. And uh, this is, we're still in the fairly early stages. Both of these projects are still in the very early stages. Uh, the, but the second one is in the hospitality, and this is working on developing a training intervention for supervisors and managers that will provide guidance and practical strategies for designing an age-inclusive workplace. So you can see both of these, we're really trying to promote that idea of how to create an, an age-friendly, age-inclusive work environment so that people can continue to work in that successful manner going into the future. Um, and then the probably the third type of research that we're most engaged in is, is we uh, examine data from large-scale public surveys and other public databases uh, to help further our work. The other type of activities that we engage in are outreach to employers, and that includes um, occupational safety and health professionals and other practitioners, as well as workers themselves. So this could be sharing relevant research and best practices from our own and others' research activities, conducting webinars and workshops. As demographics continue to shift, what strategies can employers use to better accommodate older workers and ensure a content and successful workplace? That's a really great question. Uh, so there are a whole bunch of factors that are at play here. Um, First of all, we have to think about the, the larger context in which work happens. So this is thinking about the societal factors um, that can really help support or inhibit efforts that are being made. So again, going back to the age bias beliefs that I talked about earlier, you know, these are factors that exist in society as well as in the workplace. We also see increases that are going on um, with the age of full retirement uh, for like social security happening. So that means people are, are going to be staying in the workforce longer. Uh, and then there's various economic conditions that fluctuate. So what are the current unemployment rates? How competitive is the job market? And this can also vary based on the industry in which the organization is, is, ocup is occupying. But then we start looking down further at the firm level, there are um, some broad strategies that have been developed um, out of a team of researchers in Australia at the Center for Transformative Work Design. And I think these are brilliant. Um, so the, the first one is to create an age inclusive work environment where workers of all ages feel welcome, accepted and treated fairly. So ways that you can go about doing this or thinking about this, breaking this down. Um, the first thing to think about is including age in part of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Surprisingly, age is very often not included in these initiatives. So that making that a one of the, the, the pillars of DEI initiatives would be really important. Working to promote positive images of aging in the workplace, so showing examples of people that are of all different ages. So not just focusing on people that are younger, but also showing people that are older doing great things in, in their jobs. Uh, making efforts to reduce the negative images 
that are maybe hidden within the um, hiring and training practices and the everyday work culture. And then confronting those ageist beliefs and behavior. Like I said, a lot of these are unintentional. And these can be, again, towards older as well as for younger workers. Uh, and uh, some of the other things that pe can be done to for an inclusive, age-inclusive workplace would be, you know, creating equal opportunities for training and development opportunities for workers of all ages. And really the goal here is to develop an organizational climate where workers of all ages feel they are treated in a fair and non-discriminatory way regards to all relevant organizational practices, policies, procedures, and rewards. The next area would be to thinking about ways that you can tailor work to accommodate individuals changing needs and preferences throughout their work life. So um, th these needs can be uh, contingent on pe the, where people are in their life stage, as well as physical and psychological changes that occur as we age. Uh, looking for ways to capitalize on, on work design principles to really customize and tailor that work for, for people. And again, um, the, the folks in Australia have come up with some great work on this. And so it's looking at work that is stimulating. You want to have it be exciting and in, engaging. You want to give people a sense of mastery in the work that they're doing. Make them feel like they're, they, they really know what they're doing in the job. Give them some autonomy. Give them some control over how they go about doing the work. You also want to work to create good social supports in the workplace. So this is amongst coworkers as well as with supervisors. And this is a big one. We need to make the demands that we have on our workers be tolerable. So this could be time pressure. This could be physically demanding work. Um, these things can lead to unsafe work practices. So really trying to mitigate these, these factors would be really helpful. And then the, the final strategy here was really to is focus on improving the relations among age diverse workers. So, looking to promote interge intergenerational work teams, uh, providing people opportunities to mentor and reverse mentor. And by that, I mean uh, older workers mentoring younger workers, but also younger workers mentoring older workers on some things, maybe like technology, where they could really, they, they have more mastery and can help them learn and, and come up to speed. At the individual level, and this is, again, building off of this last point, um, working to counter individuals' negative bias beliefs and attitudes that they also have, you know, about themselves and about others. Um, work on building those personal connections amongst the workers and emphasize examples that are counter to these negative beliefs that, that exist and perpetuate in our society. And then the final thing is really valuing and recognizing the unique contributions that each person makes within the workplace. Well, thank you kindly, Gigi, for sharing all your expertise on this topic. It was wonderful to have you join us on the safe side today. As we close up, we understand that there's some resources and contact information that you might want to share with our listeners. Yeah. If, um, if anybody would like to reach out, has some questions or is looking for some guidance, feel free to uh, send me an email. My email is g-p-e-t-e-r-y at cdc.gov. Again, g-p-e-t-e-r-y at cdc.gov. Or you could also uh, visit our website and um, I'll let you put the link for that up because it's a little, the web address is a little long. Sounds great. Yes, we will be sure to include that. And as people are listening now, they can look in the show notes or they may have already seen uh, as much before they logged on to listen. So Excellent. Well, again, yes, thank you. Thank you for your, your time and for those resources as well. Oh, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking with you. We're introducing a new segment to the podcast beginning with this month's episode called What Did We Learn? The title is pretty self-explanatory. We go around the horn and talk about some things we learned this past month, stemming from our work or just our lives. 
and I'll kick this off. So my wife had knee surgery about a month ago. And I think the thing that I've learned is, you know, how difficult it is for people with physical limitations kind of out there in the world. Um, and this is anecdotal evidence on my part, but it seems like half of the buttons that are supposed to open the doors don't work. And also, you know, some of the design, I think, of doorways is there's the middle post um, when you've got those entrances, it can kind of make it difficult. I mean, we granted we have a slightly wider wheelchair than I think. But I, again, anecdotally, I I'm not an expert on this, but I feel like there it's, it's been difficult to kind of fit in certain places. And you know, I, I just think that I, I wish that uh, people that you maintain buildings, design buildings, design doorways, kind of maybe would, would take a second look at that. I think it'd be very helpful. Again, it's it's something that's really given me a, uh, a new perspective. Um, so what about you, Kevin? Well, mine would relate to something um, that was in our news alert online and um, should be in the, the May issue about um, what some groups are calling a, a crisis of violence in schools among uh, teachers and administrators. It's a uh, study that explores some, you know, some findings recently from the American Psychological Association, a survey of about 15,000 or so school staff members, about 9,400 of which were teachers, but is reporting that about a third of teachers and close to 40% of administrators report that they've experienced verbal harassment or threats of violence from students during the pandemic. Um, We use some of the testimony of the teachers in the report, but there's certainly a, a lot more in what was published um, online by by APA. But just, yeah, that was that was eye-opening. I know that um, sources of stress and violence are rampant in a lot of industries, and we've reported on that. But just especially in school, there was some um, testimony even that even during remote learning that they had uncovered some violence and just, you know, agitation and the, the limited dealings that people had with one another. So that was, uh, that's mine for this month. Barry, how about you? Well, Kevin, I'm going to take us back to our deep dive discussion about lightning safety. And for for three, it really hit home for me. For three years in college, um, I worked on a corn farm in the summers. Um, We grew sweet corn at at this farm south of Chicago, uh, lots of other vegetables. And and I can really recall, you know, just from working on this story about lightning safety, just how many times we could have had some interactions with lightning. Uh, There were a number of times when... um, we were the tallest things in a field uh, when we were working as the clouds were approaching. Uh, there were times when I was driving a farm truck and, and had some colleagues on the back of the truck uh, as some you know dark clouds began to move into the area. So seeing the social fact sheet and, and reading that really um, kind of gave me pause and it kind of made uh, lightning safety really hit home with me. If you want to share something you've learned or have other thoughts, send them our way by emailing us at safehealth at nsc.org or by using the hashtag SafeSide on social media. Thank you so much for joining us for this month's episode. We know that your time is valuable and we appreciate you spending some of it with us. If you'd like to send us some feedback, email us at safehealth at nsc.org. We'd also appreciate you sharing a rating and a review of this podcast. A big thank you to KPA for sponsoring this month's episode. To learn more about their EHS solutions, visit kpa.io. To find stories such as our 2022 Job Outlook by Alan and the latest news from around the occupational safety world, visit us online at safetyandhealthmagazine.com. Also, make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Original music for On the Safe Side was composed by friend of the podcast, Steve Maslin. We'll be back next month with another episode to have more safety-related discussions, talk to trusted voices from around the profession, and hopefully make you smile a little bit. In the meantime, feel free to tell a fellow safety pro about this podcast. And remember, please stay on the safe side.